Hello, and uh, welcome to the latest presentation of the Rafali Network webinar series. My name is Andrew Harvey, and I'm the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or you can ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Catherine Randhorn. Catherine is an associate and is an assistant professor at the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Um, she studies the middle and late Pleistocene archaeological record of Africa with an emphasis on community archaeology, heritage management, and digital archaeology. Personally, Katie is a good friend of mine whom I met during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam and who introduced me to the exciting possibilities of interdisciplinary work in understanding the past. Um, Katie spent several weeks visiting me in Babati district in 2015 and 2016, where we conducted some very memorable work uh, engaging Gorwa speaking people on their experience with and understandings of rock shelters and rock art in the region. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Catherine as she gives her talk, Salvaging Vanishing Art and Heritage with Community Collaborative Archaeology in Kondoa, Tanzania. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrew, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Um, we've been talking about the Rift Valley Network for quite a long time, so I feel like this talk is a long time coming. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I do want to say that um, while I am humbled to lead the work that I'll be talking about today, I am by no means the sole driver of this project. There are a lot of people behind this, and um, I'll be talking about each of them uh, as the talk goes on. But I just want to, um, you know, thank all of the people who make this work possible. Also, mention that all of the photos are shared with permissions. There are no human remains in this uh, presentation. There are some sacred objects, both of tangible and intangible uh, nature that I'll be showing later. Uh, just to give you a brief overview, let's see, can I advance the slide? Okay, can you see the next slide? Andrew, is it working? <laughs> okay, cool, thanks. I wanted to give you a quick overview about my academic background. Um, like Andrew mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. It's a bit of a long sentence. It's a very large department. And we really specialize in transdisciplinary anthropological research. Um, I'm also a research scientist in the Institute of Human Origins, um, which is a, another transdisciplinary research unit um, that studies human evolution from uh, various uh, methods, including paleoecology. And my focus is, of course, archaeology. So I'm interested in the social behavioral aspects of paleoanthropology. Uh, my dog is sitting here behind us. And if he starts barking, I apologize. There are a lot of cyclists going by. Uh, so I earned my PhD in a field called hominid paleobiology uh, from George Washington University in 2017. And so that was really the beginning of my um, interdisciplinary uh, focus in human evolution work. Um, a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today stemmed from my postdoctoral research uh, that I conducted at Harvard University in the anthropology department from 2017 to 2019. And prior to that, I did my bachelor's degree at the University of Florida, where I uh, was introduced to anthropology and African studies. And that is where um, I went to Tanzania for the first time in 2008 and studied abroad at the University of Dar es Salaam. And it was in 2008 that I first started working with one of my main collaborators, Professor Fidelis Massau um, at Olduvai Gorge. Uh, one second. Sorry, my dog's being a little disruptive. Um, and so prior to um, college, I was born and raised in a small town um, in Perry, rural central Florida. Okay, so some of my work currently um, focuses really on two main aspects. First is the collaborative community work 
um, stewarding and documenting the deep history of central Tanzania. Um, my training really focuses on technological change, specifically uh, lithic technology. And uh, some of the work that I won't be talking about today that I also um, lead at ASU is an ancient technology makerspace. And that's a lab where we are using experiential and experimental approaches to really build interpretive frameworks to study ancient socially mediated technologies like lithics, um, ochre technology, so pigments and um, beads as well. So I won't be talking about that work so much today, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Okay, so before we get started, I had to show a, a few photos from the past. Um, it was really a chance encounter that uh, I met Andrew in survey uh, near the University of Dar es Salaam uh, in 2013, so nearly 10 years ago. And uh, we were both doing our graduate studies um, Andrew, of course, studying ethnolinguistics, and I was very interested in the work that he was describing to me. Um, and I thought that this is one of the funniest photos from that, from that time. Um, there was a large, what I think is a monitor lizard <laughs> coming into the dining room, and Andrew very kindly kind of guided it out of, he wasn't chasing it, he was guiding the lizard uh, out of the dining area so that it could you know, get on, get on with its life. Um, and that was really one of, um, you know, my first interest into the linguistics of this area was through meeting Andrew. And I think from those first conversations, uh, we began um, thinking about ways that we could work together and what um, a transdisciplinary project might look like. And as he mentioned, Earlier, um, a few years later, I was doing research, um, my dissertation research, and I was at Olduvai Gorge. And he said, why don't you come visit me <laughs> in Babati for a Christmas holiday? And I really needed it. And so I said, sure, OK. And uh, these two photos, I think, really speak to some of the work that I'll be talking about. The one on the left is a photo of Andrew and his host mom. Uh, giving us a tour around the Bati and what uh, stood out to me and what she was discussing was the incredible erosion that's happened in this area, um, especially in recent years, and the concern that people have about how um, these erosional events are impacting specifically livelihoods um, and farmlands. So we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. And then over on the right, um, Andrew, and I believe that's Mzebu walking on, um, a, on a survey. Andrew at the time was documenting place names where he would go to places, and maybe you've talked about this in the past, um, places like uh, rivers, trees, any kind of sacred area. And he was um, documenting all kinds of ethno-linguistic data about the history of these areas. And so I remember walking with him and I just had this, you know, sort of feeling like, you know, Andrew, I've been doing this for a long time and this seems like an area where there might be some rock art sites. Have you ever asked if there are any rock art sites around here? And later that day, um, uh, Mzebu did take us to a few rock art sites. And that began another project that Andrew has been leading, which he can talk more about if he's interested um, in, in visiting some of those sites and getting some of the histories uh, and, the, and the oral histories from, from those locations. So I became very interested in the work that Andrew was doing there and realizing that um, some of the rock art that has been well-documented in other parts of the country maybe extends a lot further into other areas that hasn't been well documented. And um, I also just became interested in the approach that Andrew is using, um, combining kind of oral history with uh, what we were doing at the time, which was some mapping uh, with some of the work that uh, my training is in, which I've now started calling um, deep history. And the deep history 
um, ter terminology. I won't go into too much detail here. If you're interested in, in these topics, I recommend these two books, um, The Architecture of Past and Present by Shryrak and Smale, uh, really describes why um, this term is helpful. Um, if you're like me, I really got sick of having to categorize myself as prehistorian or a paleolithic archaeologist, when in reality, I think um, a lot of us are really just interested in the distant past of humans. Um, and another aspect that I really like about the deep history concept is that it is inherently transdisciplinary. So it integrates um, archaeology, history, genetics, linguistics, uh, biological anthropology, and so on. Um, and then I've also been very influenced by this book here on the left uh, by Clive Gamble, uh, Settling the Earth, the Archaeology of Deep Human History. And he has a, a more recent book called Making Deep History. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I recommend uh, checking out those two um, books. And I just wanted to contextualize my work a little bit more. Uh, my title is really an homage to the book on the left. Um, that's essentially the table of contents there. Uh, Salvaging Tanzania's Cultural Heritage by Mapunda Msewa, 2002. Um, I highly recommend it if you're interested in these topics. And more recently, uh, I've been influenced by this book, Archaeology of the Hearts, uh, by Supernat Baxter, Lyons, and Adelaide. Uh, this is an incredible work that I think will soon be the go-to resource on how to um, how to conduct heart-centered archaeology. Uh, they describe the importance of interweaving care, um, relationality, um, emotion, and rigor um, in all of the work that we do. And I have to say, it's been very helpful for me over the last few years to kind of um, chart uh, the future of my, um, my academic work as I move through the tenure track at ASU. Okay, so to kind of orient us, I think a lot of people here are familiar with the Rift Valley of Tanzania. So I mentioned previously, can people see the, um, the mouse? Thanks, okay. So previously I mentioned that um, Andrew and I were up here near Babati. Um, here's Arusha up here. And so the area that I'll be talking about is really here in between Babati and Kolo, um, there are three um, villages essentially, the Kisese Disa area, Machingioni, which is where we work, and Itolilo. Uh, Kisese 2 is the rock shelter I'll be talking about that's um, highlighted here. And it's important to note here, um, these green squares are just a few of the rock art sites that have been documented in this area. Um, there are over 130 um, in the Kundoa area alone. Um, Dodoma is further down here to the south. And another thing I wanted to mention here is what's called the Arangi Escarpment. And out to the east is sort of a more flatter open savanna um, that's called the Maasai Steppe. And so this is a really interesting uh, location on the landscape in terms of ecology, because it does sort of sit right there on the ecotone of these two um, different kinds of environments. Okay, so a little bit about the rock shelter where I've been working, Kisese 2 is the name of it. And um, it, we know that it has an archeological sequence spanning over 50,000 years. Um, this is based on radiocarbon dating efforts of some archival work I'll describe in a minute. Um, it's also known, as I mentioned before, the Kondoa area is known for having abundant and diverse ancient rock paintings. And some people may be familiar with the Kondoa area because it is a recognized UNESCO World Heritage Center. So this is the Kisese 2 site here down on the lower right. Uh, this is actually taken during the dry season. And um, you can see a lot of the trees here have 
uh, lost their leaves and these orange soils that are uh, peering through uh, are very important. I'll talk about that um, in a few slides as well. So this um, scene on the left is um, a reconstruction from Mary Leakey's book. Um, and that is one of the scenes from Kisei Se Tu. These other two are just examples of rock art in the area. This is the famous abduction scene from a site called Kolo. Um, and these are some of the, what are sometimes referred to as the late white uh, paintings because they tend to show things like domesticated um, animals. Okay, so um, some of the colonial era work, you know, this area has a very long, long history of research. Um, first, it was excavated by Lewis and Mary Leakey. And then a few years, well, I should say that um, Lewis and Mary Leakey um, did several years of survey in this area, um, specifically trying to date the rock art, trying to figure out the age of the rock art. And um, out of the several dozen sites that they surveyed, and they would often do what we call test excavations, digging very small little test pits to see what's possible in terms of, an, of a large scale excavation. Uh, Kisei Se Tu, or what's sometimes referred to as A4, was the only location um, that had a sedimentary deposit. And in terms of documenting and stewarding uh, deep history that's really important um, because these sedimentary sequences are incredibly rare uh, for this area. And so this is an image uh, taken by Ray Inskeep who had been suggested by the Leakeys to go and continue excavations at the site. Um, and he, he worked there uh, with a team largely of Kenyan researchers actually. And you can see this very large excavation, um, including the Leaky Trench. Um, and this was in 1956. Um, and so a lot of that work, uh, like I mentioned, the goal was to um, date the rock art. Um, it was largely unpublished for several decades for a lot of reasons that I'm happy to describe or to discuss later. Um, in 2011, uh, colleagues of mine, Christian Tryon and Jason Lewis, um, began considering future work at this site uh, through archival research. And their goal was to understand the timing, and uh, the timing of technological and faunal change across the quote unquote, middle to late stone age transition. Uh, so this is what some archeologists consider a very important um, time period in the deep history of the area that's um, characterized by what, what appear to be uh, changes in technology um, and, in, and in the faunal communities. Um, and so their goal was really to understand to what extent this site could be used to um, better understand that transition. And so, this work led to a publication, if you're interested, uh, you can read that paper about um, the chronology of the site. And so it was really um, quite fascinating and successful in that um, because the National Museums of Tanzania had done such a wonderful job um, curating the collections, um, Christian and Jason were able to go back to Dar es Salaam and use um, what are called fragments of ostrich eggshell. So, um, the, so what we often find in these sites are decorated eggshell fragments and eggshell beads. And sometimes in the production of these beads, it's common to find shatter in the form of these broken fragments. And they're really great uh, for a number of reasons. Um, first that, you can date them with carbon 14. And that's uh, what Jason and Christian were able to do. And by dating those ostrich eggshell fragments from the collection, they were able to build kind of a rough chronology of the site. 
Um, they were also able to work with a colleague, um, Elizabeth Niespillo and Warren Sharp using new methods in uranium dating and on the same fragments. And so really they were able to start building what is one of the highest resolution or one of the highest resolution uh, chronologies um, in this area. So there are something like, I think at that point there were 36 or more of these kinds of ages. Um, but of course, because those eggshell fragments were taken from a 1956 excavation, the site had since been backfilled. Um, it was really unclear the context uh, from which those samples were coming from. And so even though the chronology did show a relatively strong relationship with depth, in other words, the further down the sequence, the older the ages, um, which is something that typically would suggest, you know, not too many um, disturbances in the site. Uh, we were, I was still kind of skeptical and wanted to see um, more for myself. And at, this was the point at which uh, Christian and Jason kind of invited me onto the project and said, are you interested in, in helping us investigate more? And one of the first things that we noticed looking at these slides from Ray and Skeep's 1956 um, excavations is so back, uh, it was very common in, the, in those uh, days to excavate in what are called arbitrary spits. So they're usually, in, in he excavated in inches and feet uh, to make it even more complicated. And so um, they would often excavate in like six inch spits that were just arbitrarily defined um, and horizontal. And from a geological perspective, um, that's somewhat problematic. And what's highlighted here are what we think might be some hearth features and other um, hearth features being where people um, potentially made fires um, and other features in the wall that were not really um, documented in those early archival notes. And because these arbitrary spits cross-cut um, these sedimentological boundaries, um, we weren't really sure where some of the OES, the ostrich shell fragments um, were coming from. And so that's really why um, we thought that it might be worth re-excavating um, this site. Um, but because I had been working in this area, um, well, working really with Fidelis at Olduvai, and I had learned a lot about um, heritage management concerns in the country through Fidelis, and then working, like I mentioned previously, with Andrew um, and Babati, I had a lot of concerns uh, going into this project. Um, this is the book I mentioned before by Mary Leakey, um, Africa's Vanishing Art, um, highly recommend it. Um, she did a lot of work going to the sites around Kandoa and what's really tragic to me is that the site that she documented, um, even in 1983, uh, are, are barely visible today. So they were fading back then and they're fading even more today. Um, that photo on the right there is uh, Mary coming down the hill from the Kisei Safe to You site. You know, and Andrew might remember on that trip in Babati, in 2015, we did document quite a few sites that had been um, sort of unsystematically excavated. And this is because of um, what I think a lot of people might be familiar with, um, this local narrative that I have heard um, from central Tanzania and down to the border of Mozambique, up to the Lake, Lake Victoria area. Um, it's a very, very common narrative that um, German bur uh, Germans buried gold um, near rock art sites. I've also heard these narratives in Kenya as well. Um, and so it's something I'm very interested in trying to figure out where um, and how these narratives um, emerged. Um, and one of the issues that we've noticed is that um, because a lot of people think that there, there is gold buried at these sites, it has led to um, an abundance of treasure hunting 
treasure hunting permits are still um, obtainable through the Department of Antiquities. And um, that has led to some unsystematic um, digging of these sites, which um, of course is not great in terms of, uh, like I mentioned, some of these sedimentary sequences are very, very rare. Um, and so it's, it's really a loss of, of heritage to see the, the sites kind of excavated in that way and not, not being documented. But I do think it's important to note that, um, and, and some of us have talked about this in the past, that this gold narrative may actually stem from the colonial era of archeologists working in some of these um, very sacred spaces um, without any kind of community collaboration. And I know that I've kind of spoken to people um, and, and heard similar stories where people are wondering, you know, why are the Wazungu going up into the hills? Um, Andrew has, has noted that some of the plants around the rock art sites often are uh, symbolic of uh, sacred spaces, meaning that only particular people are really allowed to go there. <laughs> And so we've often thought that perhaps it was because um, archaeologists would kind of go on these surveys without explaining to people what they were doing, um, that these, you know, these gold narratives, uh, gold narratives might have emerged from that. And um, it was, you know, with that knowledge and that concern that um, I began interested. Uh, I became interested in this community archaeology framework. Um, Christian Tryon sort of offered a postdoc to me um, to to continue work at this at this site, and I and I basically said this is the model that we need to use. Um, this is a book by um, Peter Schmidt and Innocent Pickeray that I highly recommend, um, where they have described. Um, a framework for implementing community archaeology and heritage projects. Um, and they have a lot of um, examples from Northwestern Tanzania, specifically um, working on Iron Age sites. And the idea is really quite simple. Um, it's simply that community members control the research agenda. Um, and we can you know, work towards shared um, future oriented aims, um, including the sustainable preservation of the sites and working together towards um, inclusive and um, equitable research. So that was um, how this, that was sort of the backdrop of this project in 2017. Uh, we started uh, the Kondoa, what's now called the Kondoa Deep History and Heritage Partnership. Um, this is another scene uh, from Colo. And um, so th in, in that first season, um, I really sought to work with um, University of Dar es Salaam graduate students. Um, the first, uh, I think um, almost everyone is pictured here. Houston's not pictured here. Um, Julia Sagutu is currently a PhD student uh, studying in Spain. He's pictured right here. Kusa Mashaka is finishing up her master's degree at the University of Nairobi and should be starting graduate school in the fall, inshallah. Um, and Sarah Molel um, is a recent archaeology um, bachelor's student from the University of Dar es Salaam. And she's also um, currently running a lot of the field work on the ground. And another student pictured here is uh, Nema Munisi. Uh, she's gone on to work on other projects, but she was there um, in that first uh, season. And what we were doing here is really, um, you know, opening ground. And uh, I wanted to kind of highlight the fact that we spent two years excavating what is known backfill. In other words, um, areas that Inskeep had refilled the site. Um, but you know, instead of coming in and trying to excavate it all out in one season, we excavated known backfill as carefully as we would have excavated um, a known archeological site. 
And that's because our project aims, like I mentioned, the first was to prioritize the local community agenda before the international research agenda for a whole host of reasons. Um, and from that, um, we, as, as a group um, with community elected officials came up with a series of aims, including establishing the Kisese 2 late Pleistocene and Holocene record with high resolution methods um, and to also build capacity within Tanzanian uh, heritage management um, and in paleoanthropology research in general. So here are just some photos of the last several years. Um, this is a community-based participatory research project. Um, this is an image of us uh, with an antiquities representative um, and several school children visiting, talking about um, you know, how to protect the art. I think he's saying here, don't touch the art. It's very common for people to pour water to kind of highlight um, some of the images. And so these kinds of educational um, programs are, are of course very important. Um, we are now a, a large network of students, um, educators, researchers, and heritage stakeholders all interested in studying and preserving uh, the deep, deep history of this region. Um, this is an image of a colleague of mine, Dennis Sangaith, who has a lot of experience um, in some of the preservation concerns in, in similar sites in France. And so he came to Tanzania with me in December, 2019, and we met with several um, antiquities representatives and other officials from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Tourism to discuss, you know, what's really needed to protect the site uh, moving forward. And this is just a photo of us at uh, one of the seasons um, in 2019. So a few of the pillars that we've been working on uh, since day one, uh, I think the most important is probably transparency. Um, when I first arrived, uh, I guess I should mention that I am fluent in Swahili. Uh, language has been probably the, the number one way that um, this, the transparency has been possible. Um, shown here up at the top is a photo of one of the community meetings. We have had hundreds of these meetings at this point. Um, here on the lower left, is the, the council of elected leaders. And so when I first arrived, um, I, I met mainly with the elected officials first uh, by giving these formal PowerPoint presentations very similar to what I'm doing now, uh, describing the prior work that had been done um, in the area. Because um, <clears throat> surprisingly and, and unfortunately, a lot of the people who who live right next to the site were very unfamiliar with some of the work that the Leakies and Rayan's Keep had done. And so I thought, you know, to me, the first step was to kind of help people understand the context and understand the significance of the site, um, both from a global perspective, but also um, for, the, for the community itself and some of the, um, you know, the, I, the aspects of social value that the site may have. Um, so we had several of these community meetings where um, elected officials would speak, um, I would speak. This is an area um, where it's over 90% um, Muslim. So I'm usually sitting over here uh, on the women's side. Um, and then we would have leader meetings and by by kind of systematically meeting with people, we devised um, a series of goals and aims. And um, one of those aims um, was to continue the work at the site to document and preserve it. Um, and in order to do that, we um, had um, elected, we basically held elections um, where the community would decide who would join the excavation and who would um, help out in terms of analysis and actually lead some of the analyses um, 
of the materials coming out of, of the excavations. Um, they have kind of become ambassadors or wabalozi uh, of, the, of the research. And so it's been, I think, incredibly valuable to have, um, especially in terms of rewriting the narrative about what's at the site. Um, having the excavation open, you can see down in the lower right, again, another school visit because the, the excavations are always open. Anyone can, can come at any time. And a lot of people do. <laughs> a lot of people come and ask, you know, what's there? Um, is there gold? Is there treasure? And you can see here, Julius, I love this photo because he's holding up a trowel <clears throat> and he's explaining to people that we excavate with trowels. We don't excavate with shovels. <laughs> and usually once we start to explain that, um, <clears throat> people start to think, okay, this is going way more slowly <laughs> Than I anticipated, and um, with the with the elected um, group of excavators as well, um, slowly people have really started to understand that we're not here to go look for treasure. Um, we shoot in every object with a total station, meaning we document the the um, vertical and <clears throat> horizontal extent of every object from the site. Um, with a total station, a laser, basically. And so this is a lot of precarious, very time-consuming um, work. And by doing it in a very transparent way, I think people have really started to see um, that, you know, we're not here to take gold and run, um, that we are very interested in things like beads and pigments and stone artifacts. Um, and by having the school visits and, and things like this, um, it, it's been very cool to see over the years, um, people showing interest in the excavations. And the other kind of pillar that I think goes hand in hand with transparency is to of course have some form of tangible benefits um, for the people who, who live there. Um, and so in those early community meetings uh, with the elected, officials, um, one of the things that came up again and again was the need for a primary school. Currently, children walk over three to five kilometers to Itololo Primary School um, every day. And they had already set up a school. This is very common in Tanzania to have a foundation and the walls kind of built in, in phases and then to save up some more money and then build the roof. And so when that, you know, is suggested as a project, I thought, you know, that's something that we could very easily contribute to. So we were able to um, contribute towards putting a roof and installing some of the other um, needs at the primary school. And we were also able to use this area as a base camp when, uh, when the foreign team um, would join. And, you know, this, of course, we could take we could take our Land Rovers and 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 stay in a guest house, five or ten kilometers away. Um, but I thought it was really important that we set up right there in the community that we continue to develop these and and build these relationships with people who live there. Um, I, I, I showed that map earlier where um, Itololo is not very far away. Uh, we could have running water. We could even have electricity. Um, but we've chosen to set up a camp right there um, specifically so that we can continue um, these meetings and having, you know, just sort of chance encounters and um, informal conversations with people who live there. And I think I mentioned this earlier that everyone who works on the research project and in the, in the camp um, is nominated and um, elected by the community and we also um, try to have um, equal representation of men and women um, in both the excavation and in, in the lab. And that has been uh, very valuable. Um, like I said, a lot of the people who have worked on the site in the past have you know, then gone back to the community and people say, what did you find? You know, Did you find any gold? And eventually they're like, no, but we shot 5,000 artifacts today. Um, and so I think explaining, you know, to the community in this way, it, it, it's much more 
uh, valuable than I could ever do. I mean, even though I speak Swahili, um, I don't speak Rangi. Um, I speak a little bit and um, having, you know, Rangi people go and explain what we're doing, I think is, is, the, is the best way. And then of course, um, we try to obtain everything. Um, you know, we could bring a lot of things from Arusha or Babachi, um, but we make a point to go to the Amnada uh, every time, every chance that we get. Um, the Amnada is sort of a local um, market, a traveling market. And that's where we get most of our food supplies also from farmers and from, from business owners. Um, in the past, we've been very fortunate that um, community members have come to us and donated things like chickens, which has been um, an incredible kind of sign of, I think, friendship. And um, it's been nice to share some of these meals together. Um, and so really focusing on any kind of benefit. Um, I'll talk a little bit more. Um, well, actually I might've lost some of those edits. So I'll just say now um, we're working now on um, electricity, which is also not available in, in the Mechingioni area. Um, so we're working on electricity access and also water access that will be kind of the next phase of work. Um, so some of the community archaeology um, results so far, we have the roof now on the school. There are four um, Tanzanian undergraduate master's projects that have stemmed from this. Um, and really, I think very exciting is that the site is protected by multiple community members. Um, so we don't need to build a massive, you know, fortress around the site because we know that our friends are there. Um, people who have been involved with the work since the beginning um, go up and, and kind of check up regularly and are, and are very concerned. And another thing that's very interesting, you might remember from some of the photos previously, um, it used to be sort of a more open um, grassland. And this is the site in the after the rainy season. So it's very green and trees have definitely um, been coming towards um, the rock shelter. So the, the tree cover has changed tremendously in the last 50 years. Um, I wanted to show quickly for the few archeologists on the call, um, you know, this is the, the site itself. So here in blue is the, um, the leaky trench. And in orange is the Innskeep excavation, Innskeep rotated his excavation multiple times, uh, three times as he excavated down. Um, and this is a, this is a, um, a photogrammetric model that we made um, actually in 2017. So this is slightly out of date. Uh, I think it should move one more time, yeah. So what we were able to find in that first season in 2017 was, um, essentially the extent of the Innskeep excavation, which you can see here, um, and the leaky trench, which I, which I just showed. And these holes here are what are called micromorphology samples. So they are sedimentological samples um, that uh, my colleague, Laria Patania has taken um, and then taken back to the lab to process essentially with the microscope to study from a, a molecular perspective, um, the formation of, of the site itself. And I can talk a little bit about um, those results in a minute, they've just been published. So that's kind of the excavation. Okay, here we go. So this paper is kind of hot off the press. Um, this does um, put all of the micromorphology results um, into context. And what we found um, through 2017 and 2019 is an alarming um, amount of erosion that has affected both the site and the landscape around the site. Um, so if you're interested, you can read more. Um, and this is also just to show the incredible number of people who make this work possible, Sam Porter, um, is really helping with a lot of the digital data integration, including the 3D modeling and the virtual reality um, interactives. 
Um, Bill Keegan has helped with um, looking at satellite imagery, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, Rukia Dihogo um, and, and Sarah, uh, Frank or Sarah Molel are both um, integral to the project. Husna, Julius, Elena, Christian, Elizabeth Niespolo, Deborah Kalarasi, and, and Jason Lewis, I mentioned. Um, all of these people have helped make this project possible. Uh, so this is some of the satellite imagery um, from 19, from the 1950s to today. And, um, you know, I mentioned at the very beginning, the erosion, that photo of the erosion up in Babati and uh, those red uh, soils that are starting to show through the trees in the dry season. Um, that's really not a good sign. So here, in, um, the star is Kiseisei 2, and the triangle is another site called Kiseisei 1. And essentially, um, the more red here means the more erosion has taken place. And so a lot of the topsoil that we think may correspond to the last 5,000 years has already um, eroded away, uh, particularly near Kiseisei 1. And you can see that it's already starting at Kiseisei 2. And uh, we also documented over 80 centimeters of sediment loss since 1956 at the archaeological site. So an incredibly, incredibly urgent and dire situation for heritage management. Um, one of the things we're working on now, like I mentioned with Dennis Sandgate's help, is to develop um, a site protection mechanism working with the Forestry Services and Antiquities Division to build um, essentially a shelter to protect from the sun and the rain. And that's something that, inshallah, will be going up this year and the next few months. Um, you know, the pandemic has been really um, difficult, but because I think we had such a great relationship with people who live near the site, we've been able to continue collaborations virtually, largely through WhatsApp and recorded video. Uh, Husa Mashaka and Sarah Mola have been leading these efforts, going back to the site regularly, um, delivering um, personal protective equipment, including masks, soaps, um, educational materials so that people are aware how the virus is transmitted and how to protect themselves. And they've been hosting these community meetings um, throughout um, the pandemic, either virtually or in person when it's safe. Um, from 2022, so kind of this year and, and looking forward, because the team is getting larger, we're able to kind of focus on different pro, um, programs. So Husna is leading um, ethnobotany research and hopefully we'll be taking that on for her PhD research starting the fall. Um, I will be hiring an incoming postdoc who will be leading more of the archeological science at the site um, with, you know, with the collaborative uh, framework that we've, that we've started. And I'll be continuing to focus on the stewardship um, in this area and beyond. So just to kind of wrap things up, I think this is really about leveraging power um, and sharing power to meet community needs and to steward um, this vanishing heritage. Um, and I just wanna mention that it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. It certainly doesn't happen overnight. Um, a lot of the people here, including Andrew, have helped um, make this project possible. Um, and I want to say thank you to uh, Watuwa Machingioni. There are a lot of people in the in the village who have um, contributed to this work. Uh, Fidelis Masao, Emmanuel Bosiri, uh, Masana Buire as well. Um, and those are our funding organizations. And if you're interested, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram um, at Mradiwa Kandoa. Thanks. I think I can maybe take some questions now if we have time. Thanks uh, for this, Katie. Uh, and yes, yeah, we'd love uh, to take some questions now. And, and once again, uh, if anyone does have a question, they can raise their hand and I will uh, send a request to unmute. Or alternatively, you can type your question in the chat and I will read it. Uh, and once again, please remember that the webinars are recorded. So uh, the recording will be released on YouTube. 
Um, I guess I'll I'll start with with the first question. Um, I know that you had mentioned uh, your colleagues uh, Tryon and Lewis and their work uh, with archives, and uh, I wanted to ask you um, what, what do you what role do you think archives and archive collections might play in the future of research in the Rift? Um, I mean, they're incredibly important. I can share a book chapter that we all co-authored called Excavating the Archives um, about, you know, the archival work that was done to reconstruct the chronology at the site. Um, they're incredibly valuable in ways that often, you know, we don't even know, right, because the methods are changing all of the time. Um, so I don't think in 1956, you know, it was necessarily known that you could use ostrich eggshell for uranium, for example, mm. to, for, to build a chronology. So I think, you know, I was trained, um, to always take at least one page of field notes a day, um, to obviously document those, store them in multiple <laughs> backups. Yeah. Right, and then to make those available as open as possible and as close as necessary. Um, and so that's really what we try to do too. Um, you know, I think it was Flannery said that archeologists are the only anthropologists who destroy their informants. <laughs> and so archeologists are, are particularly, I think, um, tasked with, you know, charged with the task of, of, of archiving their information. And it's something, um, that I think during the colonial era, era was not really done. Um, and that's why we see a lot of these sites that are not well dated or are not well published. Um, you know, it was, it was really, I think, Christian's efforts of going to some of, and, and Jason as well, you know, go, they had to go um, to Cambridge, UK um, to access some of these documents. Um, and that's, I think, where the leveraging power part comes into play as well that, um, mm. you know, some of these academic spaces are not necessarily um, always accessible to Tanzanian students. Uh, right. I think that they should be. Right. Um, and so I think that we can all probably do a little bit more, you know, to make these archives um, available. That's a, that's a brilliant um, quote that, uh, you know, destroying, destroying the uh, consultant, I'd never thought of it that way. Um, so yeah, perhaps uh, given that, you know, archaeologists have to be so mindful of, of what comes out of their work and, and, and saving it and making sure that it's available in the future. Maybe there are some leafs out of your, uh, out of your notebooks that we can, uh, that we can take as, as linguists and as people from other disciplines uh, in the audience. As a follow on, uh, I wonder what we would need to do. So kind of like starting today, I wonder what we would need to do to set the groundwork for an archive based approach to succeed. Um, well, you know, I, I often think from a data perspective, um, we're working with um, the digital archaeological record or TDAR. They're housed here um, at ASU and they specialize in hosting data in, you know, forever, basically. Um, mm. So, and, and it's mostly for archaeologists, but I think you could do something like that for linguistic data as well. Um, these documents, you know, you can't really use a floppy disk anymore, right? You can't necessarily use a CD. Um, so somebody has to be charged with uh, making sure that they're available and accessible um, in perpetuity. So that's, I think, a big challenge is and what we found at our site, um, you know, in, in the NSF nowadays, you have to write data management plans. So you have to say okay. what kinds of data you're going to be collecting, how you'll be storing them, how they'll be available. The open science framework um, is another resource that we use um, where we can upload these things. And like I mentioned, they can be as open as possible, but also as closed as necessary. Some of these objects are sacred and, um, you know, not, some people in the in the community may not necessarily want them to be shared. So I think that's something else to consider, right? Is who's right. who's using them. We've seen cases in the past where, specifically with uh, fossils, um, 
3D models being made and shared really without permissions and then, um, you know, going on to make all kinds of money from, from those endeavors in ways that don't really benefit the museums. So I think, uh, you know, definitely making sure that all of the stakeholders are at the table from the beginning is key. Um, and that means, you know, the local and indigenous and descendant groups from, from the sites, um, but also um, the various government stakeholders. In our work, we found that it's antiquities department, it's forestry, it's national museums, it's University of, of Dar es Salaam. So there are a lot of, of stakeholders who need to be involved. Leveraging power, indeed. I, I see Martin uh, has a question or comment in the chat here. He writes, another story that goes around is that these rock paintings are done by the Portuguese. Uh, what can you say about that? Have you ever heard of uh, the Wareno doing doing things or things being, uh, being from the Portuguese, Katie? I have heard this story as well. Um, this is an area that I'm hoping to take some of my my work moving forward is really to kind of interrogate um, where some of these narratives stem from. I don't know necessarily. Um, I know that, you know, there's definitely been a lot of erasure of various aspects of Tanzanian history. Um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe Matthew can speak to this, but there has been some more recent work showing, um, you know, Portuguese involvement <laughs> In, in the recent history in Tanzania, I think in Zanzibar, um, through the archeological record. So that's kind of a very interesting, I think, opportunity for both, you know, the ethno-linguistic work, but also the archeology span and, and even anthropology um, to kind of, you know, and I think Matthew is, has done this work um, to kind of go back and, and test some of these narratives with, um, with archeological data. I don't really know much else about that, but it, it has been a narrative that I've heard. Um, you know, people have often asked me if I'm German and if I can read the, the paintings because a lot of people think that they are treasure maps. And so they're asking, you know, can you read this and can you tell me where these, where these treasures are buried? And, you know, that's, that's a conversation where we have to kind of explain. And that's why I also want to mention that um, I don't do a whole lot of landscape work. Uh, we would love to, but like I, I mentioned, building these relationships takes so much time that we've had to focus on one place for mm. five years. Um, and, and then, you know, build those collaborations at, at other sites. So at Kisese, we haven't really heard the, the Portuguese narrative too much, but I have heard of that in other areas. Matthew, you were invoked a couple times. I don't know if you have anything that uh, you would like to add to that. Uh, sure, I can do that. So uh, <clears throat> Adria LaViolette and Neil Norman have done some archeological work on Zanzibar to try to identify uh, early Portuguese uh, archaeological deposits, and they have had some success, but have also run into various kinds of uh, difficulties with preservation. And I don't believe that they have published anything on that yet. Uh, I can let you know. I can look into it. Um, uh, <clears throat> but they are continuing that project. And uh, one thing that I can say from having worked in uh, Usandawe, just to the southwest of Kondoa, is that uh, rock art is occasionally attributed to the Portuguese there as well. But one of the things that I also found interesting is that there are other archeological sites on the landscape that are uh, sometimes attributed to the Portuguese. So there uh, are, I'm still not sure what they may have been, but these uh, uh, hardened clay structures uh, in, that are ring-shaped. And so they may have been foundations of a house. They may have been livestock enclosures. It's really not clear. And those are referred to as uh, Numbaza Guareno, so Portuguese homes. And so there is a sense that I think a lot, uh, and Ten Ra mentioned this, I think in the 60s, that there are a lot of sort of miraculous things on, seemingly miraculous things on the landscape that are often attributed to the Portuguese. 
Uh, but one thing that I would also be interested in in doing all of this is, um, and I think we might have even talked about this on a previous call, is discussing whether or not the Wareno of the past are understood to be the Wareno of today. Uh, I think that would be worthwhile uh, to investigate. And um, certainly it is the case that uh, I think that there is a growing, although still small, archaeological record of uh, Indian Ocean oriented trade networks uh, from the interior in the in the form of especially glass beads and things like that. So um, I certainly don't think there's any evidence that indicates actual Portuguese presence, but I do think there's a growing archaeological uh, record of uh, uh, more intensive interaction with with some of the uh, trade networks that the Portuguese were themselves interacting with. Uh, so yes, I am also very eager to continue looking into this with uh, with you as we've discussed many times. So thank you. Any any further thoughts on that, Katie or even Martin? If you have anything to add to that, yeah, I mean, I can just say that um, there has been a, a lot of you know the the paper that we just published on the heritage loss um, has largely affected the last four thousand years. So some of the iron deposits, you know, the Iron Age sites that we saw in 2017 are, are actively eroding. We've been able to kind of document over the last five years how they've moved down slope. Um, and, you know, we have found these beads, these glass beads um, in the upper levels, I could say, say too, as well. And so, you know, there's definitely a very important record. Um, I am not super qualified to study some of the more recent history, but I think it needs to be done. Katie, in terms yeah. of a regular field season, what does what does that look like? Sort of how how long is it, and and you know, like what how does it start, and and you know, what are sort of the major phases in the work that you guys do at Kisese? Thanks. We're we're working on on figuring that out. So we try to be one hundred percent collaborative with elected community officials and with Tanzanian graduate students um, in all phases. And so because of that, we try not to have this like, you know, beginning and end of, of field work. It's almost like it's always going on. Um, there's always, right. you know, some kind of meeting or somebody going there working on a, on a project. Sarah Molel right now leading a lot of, of efforts. Um, when I'm there personally, I spend usually several weeks meeting with people doing more of the community work and then it depends so if we're trying to do you know the, the excavation sometimes like we need you know experts like Sam Porter to come out and and help with some of the digital data integration and so that's where you might see a more kind of traditional field season where we'll have somebody like Sam um, Alaria Paten uh, Patania who, who does the micromorphology you know they'll come usually at the same time then we'll do about four to six weeks um, working with community members, excavating, documenting. <laughs> and then we spend, you know, closing is a huge thing that a lot of archaeologists sometimes overlook, but, but closing the site properly um, takes time. Documenting and archiving takes time. Oh, and I wanted to mention that opening, we will often do a ceremony at the beginning with the Waze Wamila. Um, you know, to put the, the spirits to rest because there have been, I didn't mention this, um, there have been several skeletons found at the site by Inskeep in 1956. And so um, there's definitely, you know, the, the community there is concerned about the spirits who have been laid to rest there. And so we, we try to make sure that there's time to properly um, respect them at the beginning and throughout. So it takes a lot of time. Brilliant. Um, I, I could see that as being something, a, a way that um, linguists working on language and, 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 and sort of different genre, I mean, could plug in. It would be very interesting to learn about the techniques of these, uh, of these specialists and in, in, in how they go about, about making these areas um, clear for that kind of work to go on. Um, you know, that would be very interesting. And I think that could be a possible link for people who are interested in that kind of thing. 
Yeah, there's a lot that we can talk about. Um, another thing that Husama Shaka has been working on um, for her kind of upcoming doctoral work is looking at environmental change, how people have been dealing with um, environmental change, for example, moving their farmland um, over the last 50 years. But even before that, um, she's she's been talking to a lot of Lizé as well and finding that, um, you know, people will boil some of the iron slag from the Iron Age sites uh, and then drink, uh, use that for medicinal purposes. So um, that's really, I think Husna is going to be leading that work. And I think, yeah, we could we could talk more about you know what the what the linguistics would say. You know, you uh, you'd mentioned that Husna is doing uh, is doing some ethno botanical work. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, this is sort of this is sort of a a thread that several of uh, the linguists in the network have been uh, working on very recently. I see uh, I see Crispina uh, Alphonse is on the call, uh, and this is something that uh, I know that she and uh, her colleague Alice Mitchell have been uh, working on as well. So that would be uh, potentially another, uh, another link. Uh, so it would be lovely to, uh, to, to maybe connect them to uh, the work that Husna is doing. Yeah, I lost some of my edits. Uh, I apologize, but I wanted to mention that we're going to be um, in Zanzibar for the Pan-African Congress in August. Um, and so Husna will be presenting there. Um, we'll be presenting some of the, the findings um, and having a workshop. So. You know, that's kind of next for us. We'll be in the country. So we'd love to touch base um, or meet on Zoom as well at any time. Brilliant. Um, okay, I, uh, I see that we don't have any other immediate questions. If people do have final questions or thoughts, do feel free to uh, raise your hand or, or write in the chat. We can get some final um, thoughts. But uh, right now, uh, I'd like um, to remind uh, members that our next uh, Rift Valley Network webinar will be on the uh, 23rd of March. So that's in two weeks time from now. And uh, I'll actually be talking, uh, giving a, uh, a rundown on uh, our past year's worth of webinars, looking for themes and, uh, and, uh, and, and sort of general ideas that were discussed throughout. Um, otherwise, I think that that will bring our uh, webinar to an end. So with that, I'd like uh, to uh, join with everybody in, uh, in thanking Catherine again for, I think, a fantastic um, talk, um, really sort of honestly looking at the work and what it entails, I think, from a very different perspective, but one that I think is incredibly um, important. Uh, and I think that resonates with a lot of the work that, that we do as well. After all, it's all with uh, people in the end. So thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Hopefully we can have you again in the near future. Thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate it.